A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's going to be a little tough, but uh, after that sumptuous lunch, I know all your eyes will be focused on the stage, and uh, we are in fact discussing an interesting topic because what we have seen in the last 15-20 uh, days, I mean, uh, the way our finance minister has been calling all the fintech founders recently and uh, all the regulatory which is happening in this space, so it's very tough to keep innovation going at fintech companies when uh, the regulatory environment is difficult. So that's why we thought to speak to these esteemed uh, panelists today. We're going to talk about uh, how difficult it is to look at innovation in the current uh, macroeconomic situation and also talk about how technology plays a major role in a sector where, of course, money is the governing factor. So I'll just give uh, 30 seconds to each one of you to just quickly introduce yourself and then we'll get into the discussion mode. Sure. Uh, I'm Prajak Devalsi. I am CTO at Turtlemint. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur myself before, uh, before, uh, before coming to Turtlemint. Um, I've sort of worked in variety of uh, spaces from search and crawl to building uh, developer platforms and, and location uh, before doing fintech. Um, Turtlemint essentially is a B2B2C platform for uh, insurance distribution. We are a, a pan-India, uh, both general insurance and, and life insurance. Uh, we built a large agent network of more than 3 lakh agents uh, who distribute insurance to their customers using our platform. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it. Thank you, Anita, for inviting us to this panel. My name is Devdar Yasa, I am the Chief Technology Officer at Edicard. We are a full services uh, platform for uh, MSME lending and specialization, micro small and medium enterprises. We have origination, distribution, credit card providing, post distribution services, and collections in the platform. So, uh, and we operate in a uh, very niche segment of uh, MSME lending. Hi, um, very good afternoon to all of you. So my name is Karthik and I'm CTO at uh, Credit B. So what we do at Credit B is uh, we kind of uh, provide uh, fintech services uh, for um, all the customers all across India. Right? It's more of a B2C platform. And uh, we have been operating in this space for almost uh, seven to eight years. And um, we have been a part of the digital journey of basically fintech when it started and we are still ongoing and I hope I think we are having a fantastic journey till now and uh, going forward also I think uh, we hope to basically ride the fintech wave that's um, going on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So first and foremost, I, would, uh, I mean, as I was discussing earlier and uh, that's a topic which you want to discuss today, I want to bring uh, your focus on uh, the current regulatory environment and uh, what is your take, I mean, uh, where does this all this lead to, to the fintech sector overall? I want to understand your opinion. Let me start with you. Um, look, for us, uh, in the insurance category, the, uh, I think the regulatory uh, changes have been a lot of positive regulatory changes in last five, six years, uh, frankly speaking. The regulator is very consumer focused, so protecting consumer uh, um, benefits is what their focus has been. Uh, but they've been also expanding in the uh, sort of so the private sector, private categories to expand the category to go deeper, deeper in India, uh, especially tier two, tier three, smaller towns. Um, lots of innovation, sort of they've been uh, they've been triggering lot of lot of innovation. So in my opinion, regulatory environment for tournament uh, has been fairly fairly good, very encouraging. Um, there are, uh, I think, the, the challenges from 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 a technology perspective. What happens is that um, it, it's such an evolving space, and and the changes sometimes could be significantly larger. Uh, so, from a tech, you need to respond to those fairly quickly to to get real benefit out of the changes which are happening, positive and negative both. Uh, and I think that's probably been the the biggest challenge cha challenge from a from an insurance regulator perspective. And then there are other sort of regulatory authorities who have also had uh, significant changes in the way sort of streamlining the way the distribution is happening, the way sort of sales is happening, a uh, lot of uh, 
as the digital sort of medium for distribution is increasing, sort of how do you bring transparency in that? How do you keep data? How do you maintain data? With things like DPDP coming in now, um, all of those have sort of brings in a um, lot of um, the, the pace of change is significantly higher for tech. And I think that's probably been our biggest challenge in terms of how do you keep up with that and how do you be ahead of others in, in, in this category. Keeping the tech employees at, at the toes. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, we have a very progressive regulator, right, across uh, you know, insurance, across uh, banking and uh, you know, uh, capital markets. Uh, one of the important things uh, with regulation is that you know, at the end of the day, it's trying to protect the customer and the ecosystem, right? And avoid any large kind of imbalances in the ecosystem and also protect the individual customer. So it, uh, it covers this entire uh, spectrum, right? And uh, <coughs> we have to respond to that, right? And uh, typically, you know, if you, um, if you are principle based and uh, you know, there are three or four of those, right? One is that you, know, you don't encourage knowledge. Second, you are very transparent, uh, yeah, right? And uh, a third is that, you know, whatever you are doing, right? And you have to be upfront about it. If you sort of, and, and discovers insurance, discovers banking, and discovers, you know, mutual funds and uh, stocks as well, right? If you uh, stick to these principles, then as an organization or something, anyone who's sort of trying to play outside the uh, principles, right, tends to get into trouble, right, so I think that's the way I, uh, I look at it. Yeah, uh, I think uh, pretty much I would be echoing some of the thoughts, um, what has been already mentioned. Um, see, uh, as um, as we see, as and as was mentioned, so, so the regulator here is pretty strong, right, as in in terms of basically, in terms of the regulations that are there, as in, um, I remember a paper which I used to, I read in my university days, uh, it was called the no U-turn syndrome, right? As in, uh, so uh, what do you do basically when you have a gap in the divider and uh, you don't have any uh, directions what to do there, right? Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, in India, people would do all sorts of things, uh, but uh, let's say take a country, for example, like Singapore, they would only follow what are the instructions that have been posted at the divider, right? As in, if nothing is there, they wouldn't take a U-turn, they would just keep going straight. So similar to that aspect, as in uh, here, at least in the fintech space, uh, we do, we should, or uh, we, uh, there are certain regulations which are there, uh, which in, in, the, in terms of basically uh, the space that we are working on, right? So uh, we have to basically, the RBI is doing all the regulations and uh, with basically good intentions of the customer in mind, right? So we always have to keep in mind that customer is the number one priority, right? As in that's. That, if you are able to keep it in mind, uh, I think rest of the things will fall into place. Uh, if you try to stretch the rules basically beyond normal reasoning, right, and then, uh, you know, English is a fickle language. So, um, you can interpret one word or a lack of a comma or things like that in multiple different ways. You would definitely have a whiplash effect later down the road. Uh, even the regulator basically is basically uh, takes uh, conscience of that fact and then the fact is that uh, they do s you know lay a lot of breadcrumbs along the way before the final ruling comes. Uh, the idea is that when the breadcrumbs are there we have to get an idea as to what is happening. So uh, this with the, all the fintechs kind of know this right because uh, all of us are basically interacting with the regulators on a maybe not on a day to day basis but at least on a monthly basis uh, when we are interacting with them we get a feel a gist of what the regulator understands. But if you're blind to that aspect, then you need to basically reap what you sow, right? Um, then um, SROs are there, so there is a collective thought which comes up. And uh, based on the collective thought, you need to understand what the direction is, right? As in, uh, uh, that is there. And um, generally keep the customer in mind is what it is, right? As in, uh, because finally, uh, if you look at it, I wear two hats, right? As in, I am uh, probably an entrepreneur, but I am also a customer to basically a lot of other services. Uh, so I would want my data also to be treated in the best possible way, and I also should treat the customer's data in the best possible way. So uh, that is on the regulatory aspect. The tech aspect is basically, um, given fintechs, obviously we have been able to respond very fast for all the basically concerns that have been there, whatever the changes that needs to be done 
on the technology platform. The idea is that basically uh, you need to plan ahead and then uh, have the levers in place at least in the tech aspect so that you can now uh, what do you call it, um, uh, change the levers as you would say as in terms of tech parlance it is more like change the DB flag or go and change something here or there and then so that basically whatever intended action is supposed to happen you can do it. A good example is recently and other, another thing is that the transparency aspect which was brought, a good example is the KFS document. Earlier um, we when as in the fintechs were never showing a KFS document but now we have to clearly sp spell it out to the customers the facts that that's why it's called a key fact sheet right so these kind of things are making it more um, better the customer the customer is also in, in a lot of ways well informed because these days communication you know uh, one whatsapp group is there and then uh, the groups are linked linked the message forwards and uh, generally any news gets spread across the world in less than a minute right so it doesn't really make any sense to hide anything so uh, at least from our side we have been very transparent in a lot of things so that has um, helped in basically continuing our business without any major hiccups with all these uh, uh, aspects regulatory aspects that are there and um, and we are also a bit conservative in terms of interpreting the language that comes out uh, by basically getting multiple legal consultations from the lawyers so you get multiple inputs from the lawyers and all those things because they would be having a bigger collective thought across other industry peers and even amongst the peers connects etc and all those things and they will also have the general idea they would give us a good view and it generally makes sense to follow all these thoughts in a proper way rather than I uh, interpreting it and stretching the rubber uh, as a rubber band more than what is expected right yeah thank you Apart from, uh, I mean, uh, the regulatory changes which keep on happening and uh, the challenges uh, there, there are a lot of uh, cyber risk, of course, involved uh, in the fintech space particularly. And uh, I mean, uh, how uh, you as uh, tech heads of uh, your respective companies, I mean, uh, keeping it in the safer side of the uh, consumer and uh, keeping the data particularly uh, in safer hands. What kind of steps you have been taking and what, what kind of investment you have been doing in the tech domain? Um, so, um, security is kind of like the number one, uh, what is that, aspect in our organization, right? As in, probably depending on the size of things, there could be different priorities, but um, it needs to be at least amongst the top one or second uh, basically priority, right? Depending on the size. Um, because after a certain point in time, you know, some there are only a few existential threats which an organization can have and data is close to a, and a basically maybe not a full 100 percent this thing but it is very close to a kind of a threat over there right so security is the number one um, aspect that we look at um, the other aspect is that basically we have been as an um, we come under the rbi aspect and then the regulator has had a lot of guidelines with respect to it guidelines and all those things but um, recently the certain and uh, all these other uh, bodies have come in which have expanded the umbrella of the scope of the activities from basically just um, the some of these regulated entities uh, to basically pretty much the entire uh, domain and even the DPDP bill that is there has kind of uh, basically brought in all the organizations which deal with data in any ways basically under the pursuit of uh, under the gambit of um, basically data security and basically the repercussions that can have with respect to not taking it in priority, right? So, um, uh, obviously, um, it is very important, right? Um, and uh, again, here, the idea is to again be conservative in terms of what you do. Um, so, generally, as in uh, data security has got well-led rules, right? As in, in terms of um, uh, uh, handbook that you have to follow. So, the idea is that you need to have a handbook and uh, you need to follow, follow it to the dot 99% of your uh, issues are solved, right? As in, so a process handbook or a security handbook is very much important. And uh, let's again try not to dilute it over there. So uh, you would basically um, not have any basically leaks or anything later down the road, right? So that is one thing. Obviously, technology also plays a important role these days in terms of uh, SIEM, which can start looking at all these logs that are being generated. Uh, across your uh, various systems, right? As in, for example, uh, uh, your APIs and then your data access patterns and all those things. Logging becomes very much important because in case of an issue or an event, you need to be able to audit what has happened. So 
auditing capability needs to be done across the system, right? And uh, these days, uh, the audit logs are basically forwarded to uh, the SIM systems, which can give you an alert as the system as the event happens. So I think that's very important now. I think, uh, uh, as far as security is concerned, uh, I mean there are tried and tested methods, right? And uh, first and foremost, you have to be really good at implementing those. Uh, second is you understand your business and your systems better than anyone else. And hence doing a constant threat modeling, right? Uh, with an intent of protecting the customer, right? Uh, is, is where you have to invest continuously. Now, even nothing is perfect, right? So uh, there will be holes everywhere. Uh, but overall, if you have multiple layers of security, I mean, it sort of becomes like a Swiss cheese, right? There are holes. But then the entire cheese, if you look at it, is a solid block. You know, nothing gets through it, right? I think that's the way to sort of uh, look at it, right? You need that's to have, example. yeah, you need to have sufficient guardrails at each layer to make sure that nothing passes through, right? I mean, there, and then you know you have to respond really quickly. So being very systematic, you know, establishing and implementing the tried and tested methods very well, and then uh, making sure that you know, constant threat modeling, right, is is where you should uh, focus on. Hello, I think uh, the category that we operate in, uh, all of us, definitely has a lot of sensitive personal data for customers, um, which is just required for the, the business that, that we are in. Uh, there's no sort of getting away with that. At the same time, uh, because there is a sensitive data that we are operating with, we have to be very, very careful in the way sort of we are handling data. And I think it's a, it's a combination of tech and the checks and balances that you, you create in the system um, at, at every layer, layer. So at the critical sort of junctures where the data has to be handled, you need to have good controls and good processes, both uh, automated uh, ways of looking at it and also the manual sort of checks and balances to sort of make sure that um, uh, make sure that the, the whatever process that you are putting in place is actually effective and working. And uh, it, it's basically a, um, a edge that you are walking all the time. On one side, you need the business to operate seamlessly. On the other side, you have to make sure that the, the data is, is protected. There are standard sort of guardrails. That, I mean, if you just follow just the basic standards well, I think a um, large part of it is taken care of. Uh, after that, it's basically you have to do a little bit of testing here and there, do some um, um, some on-the-spot testing, check your controls, um, separate the, the 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 ownership and uh, the the sort of the authority uh, who's responsible for different data. If you do that well, I think you you are fairly in 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 good state. Also, there are lots of products now. I mean. Uh, of course, in the cloud environment, uh, so basically two environments, right? There's a cloud environment and then there is the edge devices. Uh, both you have to sort of look at it separately. On the cloud environment, there are enough tools now to, uh, to do uh, stuff well. Um, and you do your audits regularly, you do um, the, the certifications regularly. I think that pretty much takes care of most of, most of the issues. Uh, even after that, you will have some or other sort of uh, concerns. address them quickly. I think it's the pay, the speed at which you address the issues is essentially uh, sort of important. So we've done enough. I mean, we've done alerting and monitoring. There are specific people who are responsible for looking at uh, alerts. Make sure that there's no noise in the alert, so that only the high um, fidelity alerts are getting addressed and and coming to right set of people. This, I think, a lot of it is just basics and common sense, but I think that takes care of most of the most of the challenges and issues that come in. Is AI actually helping all of you in uh, regulating it and uh, helping with the cyber fraud detection? Uh, to an extent, yes. I mean, in running the business for sure, I mean, like, you know, our entire credit underwriting, for example, is uh, model driven, right? And uh, there are certain, uh, and, and I think, you know, when it comes to cyber security, for example, that is not our core specialization. But the products that we use and the technologies that we deploy, right, for cyber defense, they do involve uh, you know, AI, 
machine learning, right? Not probably generating AI just yet, but uh, yes, I mean, you know, there is model driven uh, anomaly detection, for example, right? There is that, uh, there is identification of patterns, right? And there is, uh, there's, there's quite a bit there, right, from an AI perspective that we do uh, deploy and use. Yeah, I think uh, uh, as in the core expert is obviously not um, security, but we do have a proper security team there. But it's more on the leveraging on the product that we use, which in turn uses um, uh, basically machine learning and uh, uh, probably these days the modern name for it, which is AI, right? whatever it is that. So uh, it helps in basically logs and log analysis and pattern recognition across the logs to identify if there is any deviation in the way in which the systems are being accessed kind of thing. So this is again where we call it as a SIEM, right? Uh, which is uh, slightly bit more advanced to the traditional uh, logging systems where you log it and then post an event has happened, you come and see, try to see the log and then try to decipher what is happening. But in this case, uh, basically the, uh, what do you call it, the partner security system would be uh, reviewing the logs on a millisecond basis or close to a few seconds where the logs come to them and then they would be looking at the access patterns and, uh, uh, and basically highlighting them. Obviously, the, the systems are also basically, you know, each, uh, each customer will have different logs and uh, the pattern of them will also be different. So, you need to be ready for a, a bit of a basically noise there in terms of uh, certain things being highlighted. That's why the proper SOC team having, which is uh, monitoring it 24 by 7 is important. Again, it depends on the scale at which uh, that is there. Uh, as in, we have a dedicated SOC team, yes, you can also leverage the partner, soft team, etc. So multiple strategies there, but idea is that uh, you have something running there at least so that uh, the systems are alerting and then you take action rather than you po post uh, event action, right? As in this is more like a preventive rather than a reactive uh, uh, action basically. Yeah. So uh, alerting tools and um, basically these AI tools which use is machine learning and modeling and AI to understand the logs and uh, basically learn and uh, tell you that some some changes happen in the system is always good to have. Raja? Yeah, I mean, we've used some tools uh, in SIEM, essentially at the scale of the data that you're looking at without machine learning and pattern detection, it's just almost impossible to sort of uh, identify any threat. So uh, the SIEM tools that we use definitely do that. We also, um, uh, from a sort of certification perspective, uh, sort of managing the, the evidences and we have to sort of go through quite a few audits by different authorities uh, throughout the year, right? And uh, the, the questionnaire may be different, but the evidences are fairly similar. Right? So we use a, 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 we, uh, we use a, a product called Sprinto to kind of collect all the evidences, keep it at one place and kind of make it available. Uh, to different uh, auditors in the format that they expect. So there is some sort of structure to the madness which you need to sort of, uh, this, this actually generates and this is a throughout the year activity. Uh, so between the tools which are available on the cloud, uh, public cloud that we use, uh, the tool like this and SIEM, you know, all of these places there is a little bit of machine learning, it's just there, just a big part of it. Any new tech tools which all of you must maybe are experimenting with right now, which you think are um, further going to bring in more changes, revolutionize the industry further? I think, I mean, uh, not in cyber security, but of course uh, in other places uh, as the large language models are becoming more and more prevalent, I think there are a bunch of use cases that we see. Uh, if we look at our business, um, it involves, still involves um, um, a lot of human interaction um, from the time the, the customer shows interest into the product that we are offering to all the way the, the policy is issued, uh, especially in the health and life category. The, the, the product collaterals are actually um, very technical, which the end consumer actually do not understand the technicalities of the insurance. Uh, but sort of th those are required from a regulatory perspective and just the way those products are structured. 
um, we are experimenting with um, um, actually I mean some of them are, are in a fairly advanced stages where um, the, the, the newer uh, technologies on the large language model and, um, and deployment of those either to sort of automate some of the human interactions and to um, and then the summarization use cases of course where there are large texts sort of converting that into a simpler English and making it available to, to the customer. So I think there is, there are definitely, we will see a lot of use cases which will, which are getting built and will be built uh, both on the servicing support side and on the, on the sales side also. Of course, developer productivity is another area where there are lots of tools which are getting used and experimented. Right? I think, yeah, there is quite a bit happening, right? I mean, uh, I mean, quality is, for example, one big area for us, right? And uh, the conversations that uh, uh, someone is having, say, with a sales agent at any cart, right, a customer, or someone who's negotiating an interest rate or amount, or someone who's having a conversation with a credit manager when it's not straight through process, or someone is having a collections, uh, a collections call, right? There are a lot of aspects of it which are, you know, uh, wide-ranged, and it is pretty much impossible to understand how good the conversation was. Did the customer promise to pay? At what point in time did they uh, promise to pay, right? I mean, you know, are we losing business uh, uh, because of certain uh, behavior issues or the way we are pitching the product? All of this, right, automated speech recognition, identifying of moments, understanding uh, the sentiment of the customer. A lot of this, you know, we, uh, we, we've started experimenting and deploying some uh, machine learning and uh, AI there as well. Uh, post uh, dispersal uh, customer servicing, for example, right? There is some bit of it uh, there. We also have to be very, very careful, right? I mean, you know, there is coverage, as in, you know, what population of your conversations or what population of your uh, customers can be covered through that, uh, and what are the use cases that are covered, and you know, uh, is there any danger to it? I mean, you, know, you cannot uh, accidentally respond, right? I mean, for example, hallucination, right, with uh, some of the new. Uh, new uh, models, right? I mean, that is not done. Uh, and uh, regulator also says that you know, if you do something, uh, you will have to explain why you are able to do that. So just saying that I have deployed this model and the model said this, I don't know why. You know, that is not allowed. Right? It, it has to be transparent. So those are some of the guardrails that we have to take care of, but uh, definitely a lot of use cases uh, are working for us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think. Uh, Obviously, uh, this we would basically broadly classify this into uh, probably three buckets, right? One is basically underwriting, and then um, maybe four buckets: underwriting, fraud detection, operational efficiency improvement, and uh, developer efficiency improvement. Right? Um, these are the four broad areas where um, we primarily run our basically um, the whatever the new world of AI basically that is there. Um, so in terms of basically uh, underwriting, I think um, we have been doing this for quite some time uh, since pretty much all the fintechs do this uh, because the sheer number of um, customers and the sh that we basically provide the services to um, requires the fact that at least you need to run it through these systems to come up with basically some decisioning aspects. But uh, the idea is that obviously there is a uh, manual oversee on top of uh, basically uh, what the system is deciding, right? And um, and there is a monitoring aspect, and then there is a comparative aspect also, which happens as to in the sense that um, uh, they would be running through a lot of different models, uh, but uh, you would be basically having different models, be giving different outputs, and then you are trying to understand uh, why each one is behaving as it is and which one is behaving the better, right? Uh, for example. Um, certain events basically can change the customer behavior and all those things. So getting these things to be understood is also important, right? And the model might not be aware of such a thing. So you need to have a human oversight, especially in these aspects, right? Um, the second, in even here, what happens is that the model doesn't take the 100% decision, but it's more of a supportive action that happens with respect to what happened, uh, what we do, right? So it tells this is something that you can do, and then we decide based on that whether to go ahead or not based on certain parameters. Um, the other one is with respect to fraud detection, right? Yeah, so obviously in terms of um, you know uh, the face comparisons and all those things, 
we need to do a lot of these things, especially because uh, you cannot have an agent sitting manually, but and checking each and every customer's face against his ID faces and all those things. But uh, there has to be again thresholds where you are able to basically identify what constitutes what and uh, basically push them to a manual bucket and then get them done. So definitely a lot of work there and a lot of work on in terms of basically looking at the data and all those things. Customers are also getting innovative, you know, as in, um, um, I think all of you would have read the news about uh, there is this uh, some town in uh, Rajasthan where primarily a lot of people are involved in this. This is their prime business. So the idea is that with all these things, you will have a certain set of people who will be looking at uh, trying to get an advantage of basically the systems that we are having. So definitely these systems help in identifying such patterns and uh, blocking them basically at the onset itself, right? Uh, that is the second thing. And the systems are getting better, right? As the technology improves, definitely the systems are getting better. Um, so that helps. Uh, the third thing would be in terms of the operational efficiency. So um, as, um, as we said, customer support and obviously telesales and all those things are places where uh, you can enhance, augment the productivity of the agents. As in that is how we are looking at it. As in we are not looking at it as a replacement tool, but more of an augmentation tool where uh, basically in 1x can it become 1.2x or 1.3x. Uh, so that basically on an overall we kind of uh, increase the efficiency of the entire organization, right? The fourth one is in terms of developer productivity. I think uh, uh, in terms of basically the, at least in Bangalore, and I was also talking in terms of the salaries and the cost that is paid to the developers, uh, this is uh, basically a, a very negligible cost to basically put it on to the, uh, give it to the developers so that the efficiency again can improve that. And that the idea is that uh, a engineer who is coming into the system newly, uh, can he become productive in two weeks uh, rather than one month or two months or something like that, right? Uh, that's what we are looking at and even the members who are existing, uh, how can they review their code faster, how can they look at uh, search for bugs or understand a piece of code that has been written, summarization of the code, etc. These are all various different aspects that uh, these technologies now do very well and uh, idea is that again increase the efficiency from one to basically 1.2, 1.3 where you get massive scale of benefit across the entire uh, base of people that are uh, obviously there in your organization. This in turn will lead to better customer satisfaction and also being able to release products at a faster pace. So it is more in turn, more of a feedback loop which keeps coming in and then, and then as you fine tune these things, uh, definitely it's for the betterment of uh, basically customers and the organization as a whole. This is how I would look at it. Yeah. Sure. So before I throw in the floor for audience questions, uh, a quick comment from each one of you on what actually uh, do you perceive as the future of fintech in the current times? I think, uh, I mean, if you look at insurance, the, the, the market size itself in India is so huge. There's a very small percentage of India today uh, insured. So I think just the category is, is just very, very large. And uh, I think in short decks, uh, just, just because of the size of the pie, just you know, keep growing and growing. Uh, that itself is, is a good sort of growth uh, factor for, for the category. Uh, more than that, I think also uh, more tech as, as we see deployment of um, uh, more sort of uh, devices, uh, more imagery, uh, the, the whole ML side of things of processing some of these data and ability to sort of make some certain decisions whether on the sales side or on the claim side, uh, all of that I think uh, InsurTech is uh, I think as a, as a very very good uh, future in India both on the production side of manufacturing newer kinds of products, more personalized products and also on the distribution side of reaching out to larger customer base in India. Like for an example in India today, uh, the, the postman who um, there, there are 350,000 postmen across India. Uh, the India Post Payment Bank, which was created uh, as a sort of semi-private entity, they are leveraging postmen to do insurance distribution across across India. And we are seeing um, so Turtle, Turtle Fin, which is our tech platform, powers some of the some of that. And we are seeing small ticket insurance products getting distributed in remotest parts of India. And uh, 
massive scale of, of, of those kinds of products. Yeah, see, if you have to be a multi-trillion dollar economy, right, technology is the only way to do that, right? And uh, I think there is no alternative. It's an imperative, right? And uh, financial inclusion uh, is a big thing for, uh, for, the, for the country to grow. And the only way to go about it is technology. I'll, I'll give one personal example, right, from lending card is that, uh, you know, we deal with uh, small ticket, uh, I mean, small business uh, loans. And, um, and we cover about uh, 5,000 towns and uh, cities and uh, locations. <coughs> now, in that 5,000, there are um, small businesses in 4,000 and a one-way trip for them to a bank or an MBFC is 20 kilometers. The rest of the uh, thousand, right, uh, are within the 20 kilometer range, right? So uh, even if someone has to go submit an application for a loan, right, for running their you know, small business, right, it might be a uh, clothes uh, shop, it might be a big making outfit, it might be a, a jaggery thing, right? They have to take at least a 20 kilometer, they have to close their business and they have to travel one by 20 kilometers to be able to do that. And it's a multi-stage process, right? So that, I mean, and there is a real impact of technology there. And I think, uh, and this is, you know, one very small example, right? You barely scratch the surface. And if we have to become a multi-trillion dollar economy, this is the only way to go about it. Um, I would sum it as basically democratization of the services that are available to the customers, right? Um, so um, as, as, as we just said, uh, the good example is this 20 kilometer trip, right? And there is no way basically in the uh, traditional space of basically how some of the systems run that you would get any service done in the first trip itself, right? So uh, this is where the democratization happens be it in terms of uh, fintech services. Just to give up, if you take two steps back, uh, the actual democratization started with respect to Tri when 3G and 4G basically kind of, uh, the bars were set uh, to such a, a good level that uh, basically all of India basically switched over to that. That set basically the basic foundation. On top of that, I think um, another good example is UPI where payment space uh, five years back we were nowhere probably a small spec, but now we are pretty much competing with um, uh, China or um, basically in terms of uh, number of the digital transactions that happens on a daily basis, right? And that too on an open platform, right? As in that's where the democracy aspect comes in. And um, further to that, basically the next level of uh, basically the services that comes is uh, fin financial services like what we provide, insurance services like what um, uh, um, is provided, right? Wealth tech services, mark you services, all of them becomes democratized, right? It's very well seen in the number of uh, DMAT accounts that are being opened and um, in terms of basically the new, basically insurance, basically the number of people who are getting to the insurance space, uh, in the customers basically getting insurance, right? Etc. So all services are getting democratized, as in even in terms of wealth uh, generation, as in uh, DMAT accounts, then mark you products like probably uh, NCDs and all those things which there are some platforms which offer which is available to all of them basically on the mobile platform and none of those would have been possible without technology um, and uh, given that we have such a solid base uh, of basically digital uh, this thing of, uh, of basically wireless UPI payment space and then basically fintech space on top of that I think uh, digitally India is going to be kind of like a flag banner uh, across the whole world as we have seen as we are exporting already UPI to a lot of other countries. Um, I think uh, soon uh, you, you would just not be basically constrained within India and then move out across the rest of the world. Um, just to give an idea, back in 1600s, um, in the GDP of India compared to the entire world was almost 30%. I would say that uh, we would be reaching similar levels, at least that's my uh, wish to basically reach at that level where we are at 30 percent of the world's GDP, basically. Thank you. So, on that note, uh, the floor is open for questions. If anyone from the audience has any questions for any of our panelists, please raise your hand. The mic will be handed over to you. 
sound check. Ladies and gentlemen, we are opening the forum for question and answer session. We will be taking about three questions for this session. Over to the audience. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you for such an insightful uh, session. Uh, question on, we spoke a lot about AI and ML models, right? Uh, and I think there was a mention about threat model. Okay. So there was a mention about threat model, right? Uh, are there are there still any you know use cases which we feel uh, you know which are still not very future proof in terms of you know uh, let's say secure right which can still pose a risk to the you know fintech industry or fintech as a whole I think there are still a lot of issues I think on the underlying secure you know supply chain also which also has to be addressed so some some light on you know what kind of threats do we see on the learning models which, which are still open that will be very Okay, um, so in the digital world, what happens, as I said, when this democratization aspect happens, uh, you know, it's for everybody, right? It's for the uh, guys with the real intent and with the guys with the non-real intent, right? Um, and uh, just to give a good idea, I think um, voice cloning is something that is there. And uh, even these days, even video cloning is also there, right? So uh, these are all, it's become more of a uh, cat and mouse game, right? Uh, so the uh, idea is that anything digital can be altered, but uh, the way in which, but then the point here is that uh, uh, when digitally something gets altered, you can also have tools to basically identify the, basically the change in the patterns, right? I said, for example, uh, if you do a JPEG uh, kind of, uh, uh, if you edit a JPEG and then you do it as in that's what, probably step one of uh, this thing where it, uh, somebody tries to modify a P, uh, what do you, pan card image with a fake image and then try to get it through, right? Uh, how do you identify that? That was step one, right? So these days people have been, so they are upping their game. The idea is that you also need to be aware of the fact that digitally whatever is happening, anything can be modified and then how do you identify the modification or what are the guardrails around that, right? So models definitely have to be built for that and looked at it. There are some models which runs for all of these things, right? So uh, it's a cat and mouse game is what I can say. I think your question is, uh, you know, uh, are there still problems, right, that are unsolved? There are a lot of problems that are unsolved, right? And there are a lot of threats out there. Um, if you look at any advancement, you know, how quickly can you understand the problems with that advancement and hence respond to that is very important. Think about, say, using machine learning and artificial intelligence in credit underwriting, right? Typically, you know, you give someone a loan, they pay after 30 days, right, the first payment. And then, you know, they have to pay for about three years maybe, right? So if uh, your model has said that, okay, this person is credit worthy, then it's only after a few months that you realize if they are credit worthy or not. And hence, the rate at which you change those models need to keep pace right uh, accordingly and you need to have that kind of uh, data to be able to backtest uh, those uh, models as well that is very different from say a consumer segment where you are testing the price change in a mobile phone sale for example right wherein you know you understand customer behavior instantaneously i think there is a lot going on so there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done but uh, the fundamentals right of whether you are doing the business on the basis of models or on the basis of you know traditional uh, you know uh, maybe intelligence right is the same hi oh, so ashwari this side so this would uh, be the last question yes okay. for now we can take the rest questions off the stage over to you thank you for that last one uh, so so we are currently building a market base for pool based savings and and we are trying to change the idea of uh, savings outcomes, like when people are depositing their amounts for various RDs or FDs or mutual funds or SIPs, obviously they are saving saving for some particular goal, so we are working on that. Uh, obviously B2C category and we both cater to the same. Uh, and, and you mentioned pen, uh, penetration as a major uh, sort of opportunity uh, because we have not gone like hardly, uh, especially in tier 3. So how are you people working on that? How are you exploring in terms of uh, insurance as well and uh, credit loans as well into that category? Because uh, agents is one way to work on that and then telecallers is another way. 
but to bring out that trust built in that particular where the belief is towards the government uh, provided products in terms of FDs or loan and even though like uh, lending card you, you might have seen sir, ki they generally do not get credits because of civil score and everything and they are going for a very higher interest rate. So that trust will like the uh, crunch of the question is penetration part. How are we doing it and how we can do it, how we can actually penetrate towards that segment. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, right, any product that you are building, you need to identify that <laughs> unique value proposition, right, that uh, where you are very different from someone else. For lending card, it was, uh, you know, digitally delivering uh, credit to a new to credit person, someone who doesn't have a civil score on the basis of cash flow in their business's bank account. Right, so we started there, and then you know it sort of uh, expands from there, right? And uh, it, it's a lot of hard work. You know, clearly I came in the middle of that journey at Lending Card, but uh, it's a lot of hard work. And from there on, there are several distribution channels. What you're talking about, right? As penetration is really distribution, right? You would want to be able to distribute your product. Now, uh, then you have to look for a channel for distribution. In his case, it was you know one one of those examples was India Post, right? In Lending Card's case, uh, and in a lot of other tech companies' cases, right? It, it is uh, search engine optimization and search engine uh, based marketing, right? There is agent based networks that you'll have to tap into. And then you'll have to grow from there, right? It's, uh, how would I put it, right? It's a lot of hard work, but uh, there are no shortcuts to it. And you have to do it uh, day on day and uh, inch by inch. With that, we call it a day. Thank you so much.